Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the study this morning. Uh, we're going to continue this study um, looking at Tola and Jair. And uh, before we begin, can we open with a word of prayer? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are thankful for the time we have each morning to open your word together, to come into your presence to fellowship, to study, and to understand your truths for this time. We just invite your Holy Spirit's presence to bring Christ close to each one of us. Help us to recognize that your hand in our lives, your leading, and your correction and reproofs. We pray, Lord, that we can be corrected when we are in error and help us to follow truth wherever it leads. We pray for those that are struggling to understand the truth. Just ask, Lord, that you can help them, help them to walk in the light of us as we look at the things that you are showing us um, so that we can understand um, our, our duty and responsibility at this time. Bless our study now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Well, uh, daylight savings time is taking a bit of a toll on all of us, so not everybody's here this morning, but um, we're going to still be looking at where we had finished off yesterday. Now, we had looked at Tola and Jay here, and we had asked about how we could put these on a line, and um, there was some, some symbols here, the 30-30-30, which... When we had looked at it, looked at that in the story of Samson, we could see that if you took 30, 30, 30, that's 303,030 and divided it by 12, you would get a number that represents, well, it's the number 25252.5, which represents the 777 structure, specifically the division that we would have at July 18th which is where we had already placed Tola and Jair in our line. And then we had the 22 years and the 23 years, and the 22 years representing the 220 years of the, of the 2520 that goes to 457, and then the 23 years representing the 2300 days from 457 to 1844. And... Uh, uh, the significance there is, is understanding the symbolism as it relates to our time, that is, it relates to uh, the 2520 and the 2300 days in their connection with July 18, 2020. And that would have to do um, primarily with Samuel Snow's history, uh, where he's going to take the 2520 and extend it to the fall. And um, so there's all kinds of things in there about uh, the structure of prophetic chronology, all of the symbolism that we used to arrive to July 18, 2020 in the first place. Now, as far as putting them on a line, we don't have a lot of information. We don't have all kinds of events or battles or anything. So we're just using the symbols that are here. And we do know that there are, uh, with, with Tola, for instance, he, he arose after Abimelech to defend Israel. But we're not saying that Tola, um, in our line, we're not taking the, each of the judges and saying that their history only represents like a, a, a chronological uh, one after the other, even though they, they show up on the line. Because each of those judges, when we zoom into their way mark, they span a time that overlaps with the other judges, right? So that's because we're taking them as a line. We're not taking this as a direct history. We're not taking the story of judges and saying, this is describing our history as we move through time, one after the other, that there's this overlap. That is, they all repeat the same history to some degree with a focus on a different way more. And so Tola and Jair are focused upon this July 18th, 2020 waymark. And the further disobedience and oppression 
um, is related to uh, what happens in this movement after July 18th. Now with um, Jay Ear, he has this um, description of his 30 sons that rode on 30 ass colts and that had 30 cities. Uh, so it doesn't really say much about that, just says they, they all had these ass colts. They, there's 30 of them. And, and, it, and it's kind of a strange detail. You know, they each, in a sense, have their own city. I mean, that's what I understand here. Um, and we, we, of course, have with the ass colts, we have the symbolism of, of Islam. And, but there doesn't, doesn't say anything about their activities other than that um, uh, you're going to have Tola and Jair. These, these arise one after the other. And uh, Jair, you know, judges for 23, 22 years and, and Tola for 23. So you get the 23, then the 22. And that's sort of a, a chiasm to the 2220 and the 2300. But it's in a reverse order. So that's all we have regarding them. So when we look at these on our line, let me see here. I have to open this up. I didn't even have my file open. So just hang on a second. My computer had shut down, and which is annoying, but it happens. So anyway, when we had put them on a line, we had placed these, these 22 and 23 years, and we had also uh, put the 252 and the, the 525 on those lines. So I'm just going to open that up so we can go to it. taking a minute to open up. So <clears throat> well, while we're waiting for that to happen, before we go to that line, let's look at the further disobedience and oppression. And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam and Ashtoreth and the gods of Syria, which of course is Aram. Right, so that's, Syria is just a more modern word. And the gods of Zidon and the gods of Moab and the gods of the children of Ammon and the gods of the Philistines and forsook the Lord and served not him. Now, we had looked before at, at these particular, you have uh, Balaam and Ashtaroth, Syria, Zidon, Moab, Ammon, Philistines. There was seven uh, different uh, descriptions. And uh, um, so we can see a, a symbol there for this, for this uh, seven times. And then you're going to have this, um, they're going to be op uh, oppressed for 18 years. All the children of Israel that were on the other side, Jordan, in the land of the Amorites, which is in Gilead. Moreover, also the children of Ammon passed over the, the Jordan to fight against Judah and against Benjamin and against the house of Ephraim. So that Israel was sore distressed. Um, so you have all of these enemies oppressing them at this time. And then uh, what we're going to have is we're going to have Jephthah who's going to arise. Right? So we're not looking at Jephthah yet, but that's where we're going. And we would say that if Tola and Jair is the arrival of the second angel, then the line of Jephthah has to do with its empowerment. And go here. Yeah, I always have trouble with this when it shuts down.
see if we can get this working. It's trying to open that document. <clears throat> now, did anybody take a look at the numbers? I know I was hoping that Stephen or Iran would. Iran hadn't really been asked him this morning. He hadn't really looked at it. Um, I mean, the one thing we know is 22 and 23 is 45. And how would that relate to uh, our line? How does 45 relate to um, the July 18th date? So we have these 45 years, that's what we put there, because these are these two are together. So we know 45 relates to the 45 years of 18, uh, the, of the 1335. So I put 45 years here, but we don't have 45 years. That is, we're not saying that Tola and G are span 45 years. Where are we? Can we put 45 years in here? I don't think we would. So what can we do with this, this 45 years? Are we applying this to the Millerite time or to our time or both? Okay, well, we've been applying it to our time. So we're just saying that this is the July 18, 2020 prediction. I mean, obviously, the Millerite line is the template that we use to understand our line. But we're saying that this Tola and J year represent symbols that uh, place it where we already placed it. So in the line of the judges, Tola and Jair is July 18. So it's the arrival of the second angel's message in the movement, which occurs when July 18, 2020 occurs. So July 18, 2020 is the arrival of the second angel. It's the second way mark. And so we had addressed that before uh, yesterday when we wrote on the board, um, which is behind me, that we put... November 9th as, um, uh, you know, we had the midnight, midnight cry Sunday law there. And so the midnight way mark is um, July 18th. And then 11-9 is, so that's the arrival of the second angel. So I don't know how to address that as far as, So July 18th is the arrival of the second angel, right? So, but so is November 9th. So I don't know how to, how, how we address that particularly. Because when we look at Millerite history, because that's what you're asking about, um, we would look at 9-11 as the arrival of the second angel, as well as 11-9. So, we're trying to figure out how to how this line represents because it this whole line is the arrival of the second angel that is July eighteenth 
on on the line of the judges. But we're trying to ask, where would this line begin? Does it begin at November 9th? And so how do we address these 45 years? Are we going to take them as a symbolic span of time that somehow we could represent in our history? Well, the reason I was asking about Millerite yeah. was to, if we use this 45 years as a pattern from the Millerite time frame, Millerite into Adventist time frame, yeah. then could we address it more clearly within our time? Okay, well, explain what you're thinking. Well, we know that there was a span of time to the end of the Millerite era where the first and second angels messages had arrived and had their effect. But yet the third angels message was not clearly accepted as having arrived until 1885 to 1888. Okay. Um, how, do you, how do you have 1885 to 1888? I don't understand your... The third angel's message arrives 1888. We don't have 1885. You cannot separate... 1888 and 1885 because you've got the articles that were written and that um, one conference that laid the groundwork for the battle between Butler and um, and Wagner and Wagner yeah but see that would be in a smaller line so if you're looking at the bigger line you have to have 1888 as the arrival of well, that would actually be the rejection of the third angel. So depends what line you're talking about. Correct. Right. So if we're going to take the repeat of history that happens in the first generation, so it's going to be a rejection of the first angel's message. Um, that's going to be 1851, 1850 in there. Right. Right. Then you're going to have 1863 is the rejection of the second angel's message and 1888 is rejection of the third. So what you're marking is the rejection of the third angel in that line. So if okay. you're take if we're going to take that history um, as that fourth angel, right, in the first generation, those are the way marks that we would have. Now, when it comes to the arrival of the third angel on the bigger line that Ellen White talks about, the third angel arrives in uh, October 22nd, 1844, right? So that's the third angel arriving. Its formalization is also going to then be 1888, and its empowerment is going to be the Sunday law. And its formalization can't be when, you know, the first articles were written or anything. It has to be the event 1888 but you could take a line of you know jones and wagner or whatever and create that 1885 is a way mark because i understand what you're saying but I, I wouldn't just put it included in 1888 if we're dealing with these bigger lines because that's that's more zooming into 1888 So that's be if we zoomed into 1888 as a reform line, it would have a reform line in and of itself because we've done that with every other reform line. And then you would take those details and add it. That's the way at least I would look at it. Okay. And so I'm just being really particular, but uh, I think we have to make those distinctions of how we bring in other dates into a line. It's when we're zooming into it into a way mark now so the development of the third angels message in relation to 1888 message we could have a line of that 
We could have, a, you know, a time of the end. We could have the arrival of that message, you know, its formalization, its empowerment. And, and I think that line would also include um, uh, the 1893 General Conference of Bulletin Articles by A.T. Jones. Right. Because he's going to have that even marked as the empowerment of that message, right? Agreed. So, so he's going to have the the second angel coming down, or the angel of Revelation eighteen coming down and joining the third angel in eighteen ninety two ninety three. So I don't know if that helps us in this context here because. There you're addressing the third angel, and here we're addressing July 18. But anyway, go on with more thoughts on that. Well, the the other thing that I was considering, mm -hmm. whether of these lines that we have been addressing, whether we should also apply the consideration of internal and external. Because when, when we were looking at the, the other line that we were, we were addressing, where we have these, these two sets of judges being joined together, mm -hmm. how much of that was internal to the movement and how much of that has been external to the movement? And how does that affect our understanding of what's been going on for these these years? Okay, so what you're talking about here was Jotham's line and Abimelech's uh, right. downfall. That that idea, or are you referring to uh, where we had this Jeroboam and Gideon? Are we talking about Gideon's? I was looking more at Jotham and Abimelech. Okay. Yeah. So with Jotham and Abimelech. Because um, you had that, you had that done differently, but see, you've got the, the years here, 2013 to 2019, and then you had Abimelech's. Yeah. That one right there. Yeah. yeah so this one wasn't so much internal and external. That, uh, that I understood. It was more the one with Gideon. But but here what we had was just the Jotham is going to rehearse this history. Right. And, and then leading up to Abimelech the Bramble becoming king and then the 777 days dealing with his downfall. So we're saying that Abimelech's message fell on December 25th, 2021 because that's the end of Abimelech's rule. That is, all of these things, what Jotham is saying is that Abimelech's predictions are going to fail. Because Abimelech is, is a message regarding these predictions that were was meant in their in the minds of those who gave it for the most part as a um, vindication of themselves personally. Right? Right. So, so in that previous history, there wasn't, the message wasn't taking it, making itself king. But after November 9th, that's what's happening. And it's, and it's not going to be Jeff. It's going to be those that are running FFA that are really looking for this vindication. Agreed. Yeah. And, and when we get that close of probation with November 9th and November 15th, you know, we always just think, well, the people who joined Parminder, they closed their probation. But actually, many of the people in the movement, or probably even most of the people in the movement, actually had closed their probation there. That is, they were unchanged, and they went through, we could call them the seven last plagues, and they're unrepentant. Right. Agreed. Okay. 
So, so that's how I understood this line. But in the Gideon's line, we did have this internal and external aspect. Um, and and when and the way that when I looked at that is when we looked at the line of Gideon that was directly relating to the proclamation of July 18th. Um, in this one, you're going to have mostly, this is going to be uh, about Trump, right? I mean, this is, even though it's July 18th, uh, you know, we have the January 6th date. But, but this also deals with the Adventist church, right? Because we know that... Uh, one of the, the things that Colin said that was correct in, and that he's still trying to, that he still believes is that um, you're going to have to have uh, Ted Wilson and Trump be presidents of their respective uh, uh, churches, so to speak, um, when the Sunday law occurs. Because this is what Colin is, as far as I understand, is still maintaining that Ted Wilson has not fulfilled his role, where I say he has. I say Ted Wilson fulfilled his role and Trump fulfilled his role because it's dealing with this in a typical line, not in the bigger line, right? And, and so we understand that these um, Adventist presidents and these Republican presidents that align with the numbering of the, the kings of the tribes of Israel and Judah um, had their fulfillment already. That Sunday law was about the pandemic. And we can see here in this line on the bottom with Gideon, we have this uh, 100 days of prayer that began with uh, March, March 27th, 2020, that had to do with the pandemic. That's why they introduced this 100 days of prayer that ended on July 4th, which symbolically is the first day of the first month for the United States. And 187 days later, you're going to have the January 6th uh, siege of Washington, right? And, and then there's the, to July 18th, there's the 13 days. And then also the bombing of Nashville, December 25th. So, so the Trump Nashville prediction here is, is relating to external events um, with both the Seventh-day Adventist Church and the United States. Here in this one, Jeroboam, this is about the prediction itself and the, the movement's response to that failed prediction, right? Because you're going to have the proclamation of the Nashville prediction. You have this June 27th date, which um, is 21 days before July 18th. That's the three weeks of Daniel uh, praying. And then you have the rejection after July 18th, the rejection of the message on December 6, 2020. And then we still have this bombing of Nashville in here because that's connected to this prediction. But this is more about the movement's response to the prediction, its action and response after the failed prediction, and the witnesses that this prediction was correct. Um, and this one's more about uh, the Trump, Trump and the Adventists, right? So about the kings of Judah and Israel. So that's why we had it in internal and external in that sense. So how would that relate then to to Tola and Jair? What are you what are you trying to propose about this? Because the forty five years we can attach to, um, you know, from seventeen ninety eight to um, eighteen forty three, right? The end of eighteen forty three, right. <clears throat> The situation that we have right now, like with this with Tola and Jair, if we're looking at this as a pattern for our own time, we're going to have situations that we're going to have to be examining that would be the internal development within the movement itself. 
as to how we're able to understand more and more of this message before we're able to give the message. Okay, so since this is about July 18th in this movement, it's about how we approached the failure of that prediction specifically. That is, it's focusing upon the events around July 18th. Right, that's that's what this line is showing, the events. And, and what we have with July 18th, um, we're going to have uh, the... So the different studies that happen there. So we're going to have on the 17th, I'm going to do a study where I present um, that the prediction may fail. Right. I'm going to do that Friday evening. Now, I've, now in some ways, I, I'd already believe that that if the prediction was going to happen, it was going to happen at, after dark on Friday evening because Ellen White has the vision Friday evening. And, and it's at the evening, not not you know in the middle of the day or anything like that, that that happens. So I believe that it was going to happen at the beginning of July 18th, not, not you know later in the day. And and so I presented the Mayan failed prediction line, and um, and that's what the previous study dealing with Abimelech. Uh, addressed as well so it addressed that um, November 9th the, the the Mayan calendar and its relationship to the prediction and that's going to be the empowerment of the first message on the line of the judges but this is now the arrival of the second message so this is the transition this is where we see um, April 19th right if we're going to look at in this sort of thing, we see that first disappointment. Um, and, I, and I shouldn't say it wasn't uh, with Gideon. It was with, yeah, with Abimelech. It was with Jotham and Abimelech. So we got a Jotham and Abimelech, if I was saying it wrong, Jotham and Abimelech addressing that uh, mind calendar study, which would align with, with Snow's study, um, regarding the end of the prophetic periods. So those two would be parallel. Um, so now here we have July 18th itself. And uh, the big issue on July 18th, because if I'm, I'm trying to remember what, because um, Larry Hine did the presentation on, on July 18th, saying that the prediction was going to happen. Uh, even though we were halfway through July 18th, and I, I knew by then it should have it should have happened, but he was saying, you know, we need, still need to have faith and and so forth. And then, of course, after it doesn't happen, he's going to be one of the leading ones opposing July 18th. Now, um, and what they should have done, this is just my opinion, is I should have been presenting on July 18th, or at least right after about what I had said prior to July 18th about the failed predictions. But FFA wasn't interested in hearing that. Um, so, and Jeff steps out of the way. After July 18th, Jeff doesn't do anything anymore. And, and I think the last presentation he did was July 11th, or the previous Sabbath, um, if I remember correctly. But anyway, what we have is um, Tola and Jair is representing that history. And so if it's representing that history, it still has a first message that arrives. And that's formalized and empowered. And, and that's what we have to decide is how this these symbols of the 23 and the 22 represent do they represent spans of time that we could symbolically attach uh, to this to these dates I would have to think that that would be correct okay. 
Now we have two things here. We have the 23 and the 252 and the 22 and the 525. And so we haven't really addressed what that means as far as, I mean, we know that it gives us July 18th as the center, right? And that was just taking that 30, 30, 30, dividing it by 12 to get 2525, 2.5. But didn't we have this as well before the flood? Um, so what, what do you mean? The have the two fifty two and the five twenty five. Correct. I don't know. I don't know of that. I know we had the sixty five, the one eighty seven, and the seven 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 before the flood. I don't know the two fifty two and the five twenty five. Well, can you tell me what you're talking about? Maybe it, it'll trigger my memory. 187 and 65 added together give us 252, doesn't okay. it? Yeah, okay. So we have the 252. Yeah, 65 and the 187 gives us the 252. And the 777 total is what we were looking at regarding Lamex age. Yeah. So... We have these symbols occurring in Genesis, showing us or giving us a, a pattern of a warning prior to the deluge. Yeah. So is this, again, a pattern of warning prior to the Sunday law? Well, yes, which is what we've always understood that our message is about. Right. And July 18, 2020 definitely symbolizes that. And, and see, the part of the problem in this movement is we have people who believe that, that we actually are in the Sunday law in the sense of, I mean, we know we've been in the Sunday law since 9-11. But 9-11 isn't the Sunday law that Ellen White's talking about because it's not right. particularly about Sunday, right? And the pandemic is a type of the Sunday law, but it's not about Sunday. And we can't have a Sunday law that's about something else other than Sunday. Correct. Because that would make no sense. It's not a Sunday law then. And this is what Parminder and Tess were suggesting, is that we're going to have a Sunday law that's going to be about, um, you know, human rights, well, that's not a Sunday law. No, right. that's that's just a distraction. Right. But it's it's you know, what they're presenting is is similar to what like, we, we could be we could argue that human rights are a type of the Sunday law, not the ones that they're talking about. But we could look back at um, the Civil War. Because there is a parallel between um, the Sunday law and the Civil War in in eighteen you know, in the 1860s, right? In a sense that the Sunday law could have occurred there if God's people had done their work. Right. But but they didn't. So the Sunday law didn't occur. But we had something that was a type of the Sunday law. We know that history typifies our history. So, so uh, Tess took that and said, well, that's what our Sunday law is going to be about. It's going to be about civil rights and we're going to go back there and it's going to, you know, but ignoring that, that it's not about the Sunday at all uh, is, is of course a wrong idea. Now that's true. There were some things that they said that were true that I hadn't noticed before. And the one thing is that initially when Ellen White talked about a Sunday law, it was always the death decree Sunday law after the close of probation. And as time went on, uh, by the time you got to 1884 and so forth, uh, she now explicitly talked about a Sunday law in the United States. That is what we would call the national Sunday law. And initially that was not 
um, understood. That's something that was unfolding to her as time went on. And, and that's an important point, um, which I'm not gonna go into now, but in, in seeing how the idea of the Sunday law develops in the movement in the Adventist church is an important detail that just was not ignored or, or just, just is ignored, wasn't noticed um, by lots of people, including myself. And that was one of the things that was compelling is that Tess noticed this, but it doesn't lead to the conclusion then that the Sunday law was only for that history. Because the Sunday law, according to Ellen White, goes to the end of time. So if we understand, you know, the spirit of prophecy, that Sunday law is still future. Just because they were looking for the Sunday law and it didn't, didn't come in their history doesn't mean it doesn't come in our history. Um, so so we, we have these symbols, as you say here. We have these symbols that tie us to the flood. And the flood is a type of the Sunday law. Right? That's... No disagreement. Yeah, and so we have the 252 and the 525. So we have this 45 years here. Now, um, how can we relate this as far as time? What is it that we what is it that we're missing as far as this symbol of the 45 years as it relates to our line and the July 18, 2020 prediction? Well. Is it possible that for our time that we need to look at this in the opposite way rather than 23 followed by 22 that we need to look at this first as the as 22 the symbol of restoration to the temple followed by the 23 being the gathering of the people. Mm. Well, you'd have to explain more what you well. Think. If we were to use the 1843 chart. Yeah. We have a period of 220 years from the time when Manasseh is taken captive to the, de the third decree rebuilding Jerusalem, right? Yeah. And after that is the, the rebuilding Jerusalem goes forward, we have 2,300 Arab and Boker or Arab Boker until the sanctuary is made right. Now, the 220 is a symbol that we have accepted as being the restoration of the people. We're coming again to an understanding of what God's law is about. We're coming again to an understanding of our position and our need for true righteousness, a righteousness that we cannot produce of our own. Mm -hmm. When that is, is beginning to be understood, then we have the 
23, which again gives us the relation to the 2300. Now, while there are several components to that 2300, especially the six or seven <laughs> prophecies that occur in the first 490 years, all of this relates to our standing before the throne of grace. So does Tola and Jair give us the same type of symbology? Mm. Well, I don't know. That doesn't fit in with my thinking of what this is. I mean, obviously, because I'm trying to fit this in, do these relate to dates? That can we place, can we take Tola and Jir and take the symbols that were given us and give a starting time for it and 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 a and a way mark, a, a date for each of these waymarks, but particularly then we have to address the darkness, because anytime we we look at a line, we have to we have to figure out what the darkness is. And then what the increase of light is and what what then formalizes that increase of light, what empowers it. And the point, you know, I understand your point very clearly. The point that I'm trying to drive at, if we accept that we do not have a message based upon time, does that mean we do not have a message based upon symbols? So if we have a message based upon time, we have a message based upon symbols. Well, the the point that I'm making okay. is we're looking right now trying to place this with Tola and Jair based upon dates. Mm -hmm. And I'm asking, instead of placing it using dates can we establish this line based upon the symbols that have occurred within the movement recently okay um i don't see how to do that okay. i mean I don't, I don't know how to mark a way mark so yeah, I know you understand clearly, but just so here we have a period of darkness. We have an arrival of a message. And we need to recognize what this message is that arrives. Now, when we dealt with Jotham, right, and Abimelech, we know that the message there related to the message of Jotham, related to the mind calendar prediction that we would fail that July 18th would fail. So we, we're not going to make this, Tolengier is not the same line, right? This is a line that relates to the transition from a message, and, and, and we're not saying that the second angel arriving here is um, July 18th on this line. I mean, we're, we have this symbol here, so... Um, I want to make this clear. So I here have the 252, right, and the 525, and I'm saying that that represents the the 777. But we have this 45 years here, right? And so I'm so does the message of Tola and Jir, you know, just begin like we've been doing all of it, you know, starting at you know November 9th and going to December 25th, 2021. Or does this message have some other place where we can say that there is this period of darkness and the message arrives that's formalized and empowered 
and then a second message arrives that's formalized because this could even start on July 18, 2020, right? Correct. Yeah. So, right. So that first angel arrived could be July 18, 2020. The period of darkness would be the period prior to that prediction. That would be our, you know, some under understanding or lack of understanding or some attitude or something. Right? Because we don't have a specific enemy that's listed here, which usually helps us with our period of darkness. We just have that they're judging. Now, of course, this judging would could relate to uh, the judgment, right? So if we look at the period of darkness, what would the period of darkness be in regard to the judgment? In some ways, it's a, a type of uncertainty. But it also, you know, relates to sin. Of course, darkness always relates to sin. So this movement has experienced something. Yeah, so 220 is the nethanim. Tola and J airline has numbers going backward and forward. Reminds me of, this is Angela writing here. It's just, um, Reminds me of Theodore's line with years likewise advancing and then going in reverse with specific way marks. These dates and events must have some bearing on the recent past, present, and future. Okay. Yeah, so I would agree with Angela there. Do people understand what she's uh, saying? Now, when we deal with the Nethanim, so remember, we get the 220 Nethanim from Ezra chapter 8, verse 20. And to understand the Nethanim, the Nethanim is, it has this symbol of restoration, 220 Nethanim, right? Those are going to go with Ezra when he goes to Jerusalem. And the Nethanim are not Jews, right? They're the ones who serve in the temple. So this idea of the Nethanim then represents non-Adventists who end up receiving a message, is how I've understood it. So generally we recognize them as uh, the Protestants who join us at the Sunday Law. But then she's relating that... Um, that this has numbers going backward and forward in the sense of uh, we have a mirror of the 2520 with the 23 and the 22 in the opposite order. We also have the 40, that makes the 45 years between, uh, you know, the end of the first 2520 and then the end of Miller's prediction. Now, as far as um, then the first day, the first month, that that's what's going to come from uh, the study of the week of Christ. We're going to get to April 5th, 2030. But I don't think we're, we're going to bring that line to that period of time. Um, well, here's another uh, suggestion, I guess. So when we go from, so here's what we could do. We could take this line and we could say that, that this is... Um, July 18th. So I'm going to do it this way. So just 
remember, a lot of these things that we're doing are just, uh, these aren't conclusions. So if I put this as July 18th, that there's a period of darkness that has to do with our lack of understanding of the failure of our predictions, right? So the uncertainty. So we get to July 18th, a first angel's message arrives. And, and that's going to be the message that our prediction has failed. And that's the time of the end as well, right? Correct. We made, we made a prediction. We have a time of the end. We get to the time of the end. And we are at the time of the end. It's July 18, 2020. And now we're going to have an increase of light. And then we're going to have a formalization of a message. Now, um, we have the 252 here, right, and the 23, because that's how we're taking this. We're just dividing this number into the 252 and the 525. So we're taking this 252, and this would then bring us to, so I'm going to do this. I'm just going to put this above. And this is going to bring us to uh, March 27th, 2021. Right? 252 days bring us to March 27th. Okay. Does that seem uh, reasonable? Well, it's mathematically logic. Okay, because because we already have that span of time, we know that span of time, right? Okay. Um, so this is the second angel arriving in in this line. So there's a message that comes in relation to March twenty seventh, twenty twenty one, and that message is going to re relate to. To what specifically? Now, we didn't have anything happen on March 27th, 2021 that we know of. Stephen, we don't have anything for March 27th, 2021 as an event, right? That we know of. Yeah, so I agree. Okay. But it must be the arrival of a message. So how would we relate that to an arrival of a message? We haven't addressed the formalization and the empowerment of this first message. What studies were we doing on March 27th of 2021? Well, I did the study, which was the 13th study on the week of Christ. Now, of course, that's going to be on March 26th. But it's, uh, you know, it's, it's still going to continue. It's going to start after sunset, I believe. Well, it's going to start before sunset. Um but it's going to continue into March 27th. So that's the one that I would, and, and that's the week of Christ study. And it's the 13th study on the week of Christ. And remember March 27th, 2021 is on the biblical count cal calendar. It's the 13th day of the 13th month. Right. So that study happens on the biblical calendar of the 13th day of the 13th month, because that starts at sunset. What was the biblical year? Um, the, the biblical year? Yeah. Uh, uh, 6065. Now, with the, the um, 
the rabbinic year. So, so one thing when, um, when we had that September 23rd, 2017 study, that was the end of the rabbinic year 777, right? 5777. Uh, but this year here, the 13th day, the 13th month, that's coming near the end of the, uh, well, that's the rabbinic year 781. So 5781. So that's July 18 or 187 backwards, right? Um, and they have that as on the rabbinic calendar, it's Passover, the 14th of Nisan, right? So, so that's the date we have for 2021. So it's the 13th day of the 13th month. But it's also the study, the 13th study on the week of Christ. So I was doing the week of Christ studies on Friday evenings. <clears throat> so that study occurs on that date, March 27th. Now, uh, I was dealing there with, um, in the study, I was dealing with the metonic cycles, the prophetic years versus solar years, and the 273 and the 2569 days. And also with August 7th, 17 AD as the destruction of Jerusalem and not August 7th, 70 AD. So this was a refinement of an understanding of the week of Christ and how we looked at the dates. So August 6th, 70 AD is the destruction of Jerusalem. So August 6th was, you know, Hiroshima, right? It's also the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. So this is what came into our understanding here. It was at least clarified on March 27th, Okay. So if we're going to look at a formalization and an empowerment of this message regarding July 18th, um, regarding the first message that arrives on July 18th, this, this would be what message? So what is it that we, we have on July 18th that follows July 18th that would relate to an increase of light or an increase of knowledge so we're going to do our initial studies well that's when we decided to carry on and find out why it, why the the prediction had apparently failed in my books, it never failed. It was a test and it was was a disappointment to those who expected Nashville to be fireballed on that date. So right. the increase of light is just continuing to receive from the Lord to diligently search him and find out where we are, who we are, what we're to accomplish. Now, I already understood before July 18th that if it failed, I knew what it meant. So, I mean, I presented that on July 19th. And also really on July 17th, you know, which is technically July 18th, um, you know, but, but by the time I finished the study. But um, I understood that it was telling us something about our lines because I'd taken the position right from the beginning that our line was typical. I understood that we were, um, that July 18th related to Samuel Snow's letters. Samuel Snow's letters are going to be addressing a prediction before midnight. And we, we understood that we were making a prediction and that was correct to make the prediction that we did. 
because God had led us in making this prediction. But we, we should have been able to recognize that, that that was for us to experience Millerite history. Now, we're, we're going to do, in, in the studies that we then uh, proceed to go through, uh, we're going to go through all kinds of uh, different studies. We're going to study Acts 27. We're going to study uh, the 2520 again. Right, we're going to look at that. Um, now, when it comes to the formalization of the message, I mean, this doesn't necessarily have to do with videos and stuff that we did. It could have to do with the paper that I published regarding um, uh, you know, regarding uh, you know, July 18th, whatever that, I'm trying to think of the title, the type of the paper title of the paper it's called after july 18th right so this paper after july 18th um becomes part of um let's see here i'm just trying to figure out when this was published so this is going to be published just a, a while before it, well i have here the date as uh uh October 30th. Uh, let me see here. I guess I wrote it on October 20th. That's when I started writing it. I'm not sure the date I finished it. Now that's going to lead into what ended up happening with um, uh, FFA. So their response. But I'm, I'm going to say that this Oh, the, today is the 718th day since March 27th, 2021. Thanks for that, Iran. Um, okay. So how do we address this on this chart? Can we just, can we just go here? Today is March 15th, 2023. The Ides of March. Yeah. Now, I know this is kind of, I mean, it seems a little bit presumptuous here at this point, but, but I would say that this might be Today might be uh, the arrival of another message. But, uh, so that's um, how many days again? 800 and 718, so July 18. Okay. So this is just the study that we're having here today. That's what we would say, if, if we're going to put that there. Whether that's the end, we could mark it as something else. Um, but anyway, I'm just putting it there just so we have it. We might put March 15th, 2023 at some other place on this line. <clears throat> okay. So this is a bit more helpful. You can see what, how this fits together. Now, um, now, if we counted from March 27th, 2021, I was just... Did you count how many 525 days are from there? I'm pretty sure you would have. That's just September 3rd, 2022. It's the sixth day of the sixth month on the biblical calendar. I don't know anything in particular to that date. September, 20, uh, September 3rd, 2022.
Um, so. So in using this pattern, yeah. If we if we're looking at this further after July 18th, yeah. What would we see as being the point of the formalization? Well, I'm just saying that it would be taking that message of what I understood and putting it into a paper. And, and what the paper is, is this paper called After July 18th, right? Okay. So that paper is, um, I can't remember when I finished it. I, I have to find that out. I know when I started it, October 20th, um, I think I finished it on October 30th because that's when I created the PDF, right? So usually that indicates that I finished the paper I created the, uh, well, pardon me, uh, I, yeah, so I created the PDF on, yeah, October 30th, and so that's, that's when I would say that I probably, and October 30th, we're going to be having those, uh, when do they, they get the meetings there in 2020? Um, they were doing the meetings about that same time because it was prior to uh, the election. Yeah. Okay. So. Yeah, because I know it's it's uh, I send it, I put it out. Um, and Bronwyn asked if she could use the paper. So I'm just trying to figure out when I first sent it out here. I'm just. Um, so the paper comes. Yeah, so it looks like I'm, I'm right about the 30th, because uh, that's when I first send it out. Um, in in an email to uh, with the Zoom meetings. And I send it out in, a, in an email that says, note the time change from daylight saving to standard time. Um, well, so that's when I first send it out. It's going to be October 30th, Friday, October 30th. So I would put that as the formalization of that message. But what does that change in time have to do with anything prophetically? And it's in big, bold, uh, bold letters, right? So I put it in, in a larger font. Note the time change from daylight saving to standard time. Um, and I'm using that as that date as the formalization. Is there a symbol there? That's kind of what it looked like. Okay, so October 30th, 2020 is the 13th day of the eighth month on the biblical calendar.
Oops. Here. 13th day? 13th day of the eighth month. <clears throat> okay. And we have this change. So is there a symbol in the change? Me putting a note about the change of time. Is that symbolic? Again, it would seem as though. So what specifically is it saying about the change of time, symbolically? Well, if we combine the date and the time, I mean, the time change. Can't we say that? Um, okay, 13 is part of the rebellion, right? Well, this is, we, yeah, but the idea here is that this is a symbol of Palmoni. Okay, well, I hmm. probably should write it instead of 13th day, 8th month. I'll do it as 8th month, 13th day. <clears throat> no, I mean, you had it right the first time. The question that I would be asking, if we relate this to Ezra, didn't when when did they leave babylon and when did they arrive in jerusalem according to ezra well they left babylon on the first day of the first month they arrived jerusalem on the first day of the fifth month and what you're looking at here with the 13th day of the 8th month to the 13th day of the 13th month is a five-month span. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and I just wrote it in the different order because that's how Daniel 8.13 is. Still the same day. I, no, I understand, but I was looking at it yeah. as to the span. Yeah, so it's five months. So is this from the first angel's formalization to the second angel arriving, something that we could then tie with what we have seen with this, with Ezra. Okay. Yeah, well, definitely we have the symbol there, the, the five months on the biblical calendar. Right. Okay, then as far as an empowerment, because we formalize this, I put this paper together, I send it out, right? It's going to be addressing um, our disappointment and what it means. And this is going to directly relate to uh, the understanding of the lines. So there's, there's a whole bunch that happens here uh, in this paper. Yeah, the time change is the next weekend. Yeah, but I'm just giving the notice of the time change is the point that I'm making here. So it's going to be um, in my email because um, I'm dealing with the the studies in Ezekiel will resume Sunday at 7:30 a.m. Mountain Standard Time. So I'm giving this email regarding. Um, the studies in Ezekiel and, um, and then I put in big capital letters note the time change right so it's going to the time change is going to happen on that Sunday um, and um, so so anyway that's that's why I'm, I'm taking a note of it just because it's it stands out when I look at the email. Yeah, and that to me, uh, just another one of those, you know, divine providence things. You weren't, you weren't calculating this. It's just something you've done, and you've noted it. Yeah. Um, and then that night, because this was uh, a Friday, I, I said that we were going to be discussing Heather DeRosel's paper. Um, because she was dealing with this topic of we can't we can't use uh, symbolic time 
uh, her paper. Um, yeah, I can't remember the title of it, but we did, we ended up discussing it that night. That's um, so. So definitely we come to a head. The message now is formalized. I'm looking at July 18th and addressing that, that whole issue, right? That's a formalization of a message. The message is now formalized. We've come to the conclusion after, uh, you know, from July 18th, we've been studying. I put together the paper. It's sent out. It's formalized on this symbolic date um, with this information about a change of time. And, and of course that would, would relate to what we're talking about in our paper that we're not, um, because I address that whole idea of how um, we have some choices. And that's one of the things I said from the beginning though, is we would have to look at July 18th. We had three different options. Either we were right in regard to the time, but wrong as to, to the event, right as to the event, but wrong about the time, or we were, well, we could even say it fourth, we, the event happened and the time was correct, but of course the event didn't happen. Um, or that, you know, we were wrong in regard to both. And, and that's going to be the conclusion that, that um, the majority of the movement are going to make. We were we were wrong about the time and the event, right? In in some ways, I mean, they could say, well, the event is correct, but you know, we got the wrong time for it. We need to find and set another date, right? Um, but that's not what the majority were doing. They were just abandoning the whole idea completely. They weren't going to set another date. And, and we're not going to set another date, but we also accept that the time was correct, but we misunderstood the event. That event is still future. We just placed that date at the wrong time or placed that event at the wrong time. We, we tied it to the date of July 18th because it is tied to July 18th. Right? I mean, we, we saw that. Hiroshima is tied to July 18th, 26th day of the fourth month. There's all these different ways we tied it. But we, we just were convinced believed. of all this. We were convinced at that point. Yeah. Well, I'm still saying that we, we are correct in tying it. Absolutely. July 18th. It, it's just that, and, and, I, and I made the statement many times before July 18th that everything points to the event happening on July 18th. But if it doesn't happen on July 18th, it doesn't mean we were wrong about July 18th. Right? Because everything shows us that. What we would what we would have to recognize just like October 22nd 1844 is it started the day of judgment, it didn't end it. And so July 18th relates to something internally within the movement regarding the message, not just of Nashville, but of everything connected to it, the Sunday law, end time events. And, and we needed to understand what that was. That's what we didn't fully understand after July 18th at first, is how does this all relate? How come we had this date and we put the event there? So. Okay. So I addressed that in the paper after July 18th, that it had to do with our lack of understanding of the lines. So that's what's going to be formalized in that paper. So does that then give us the direction to place December 6th as the empowerment? That's what I would do. Right. So I would just say December 6th is the empowerment of that formalization of the message. And that it, it comes, of course, with the rejection of the paper, because that's really what's being rejected. Right. Well, the, the entire point about July 18th is also re rejected 
Yeah. But they're rejecting my explanation of the disappointment. They're rejecting everything. Yeah, I know. But specifically, if you read the paper, they're they're actually addressing my arguments and rejecting them. Right. And, and in some ways, they're actually ignoring my arguments, too, because they don't address the main points of the paper, but they address right. the, the. More than anything else, they're also rejecting Elder Jeff's leadership. Yeah. On that point. Yeah. Now, I'm sure Jeff must have read that, that paper. Maybe he didn't. I don't know. On that, I have no idea. Whether he decided not even to look at it and just leave leave things alone, I don't know. But I don't know how he could. It would be pretty tough for me. Um, right. Not to look at what happened. It would be like me, uh, you know, not paying attention to what happens to the guitar store after I leave, right? I'm going to note when, you know, it closes down. Um, that type of thing. But anyway... You know, it's it's sort of his baby and you, you don't you know, you're going to still want to know what happened to it. But but, you know, maybe he just put it all out of his mind and didn't pay attention to what this declaration was. But I don't I don't see how he could see it as anything else other than a rejection of his entire message. And that would be pretty tough to see. So. <clears throat> so anyway. I think that's been helpful looking at Tola and Jay here because now we can understand this, this way mark, this July 18 way mark on the line of the judges, right? That, right. So we're taking Tola and Jay here. That's July 18, the second. And so we can understand what that message is that that is the message of after July 18th. And you can see how the formalization of that message is going to be December 6th, because even though it's the empowerment of that first message of Tola and Jair, it is also a formalization of this other message, which is a second message that isn't particularly the same. So remember, Tola and Jair is the rival of the second angel on a bigger line, right? But when we zoom into Tola and Jair, we, we go into this line here. Um, this line here is starting at July 18th. It's an arrival of a message. And December 6th is an empowerment of that message. Not because of its rejection, but because of being able to stand for the truth in, in the face of that rejection. Right? This, this movement was empowered when we were banned and that that declaration was published right so that message now is empowered it separates out a whole group of people you know um that now we we actually have people who have accepted the message of july 18th in this movement the ones who haven't have rejected that and so that's it anyway that's that's where we're going to finish today. Any final thoughts? Yeah, I this would are... become. I'm sorry. sorry. Go ahead, Dwight. No, you go ahead, Ron. I, I was just going to say that you know, again, with each one of these studies, I, I become more and more under. I, I get more and more understanding about what's going on and how we're zooming in and out of lines because that's kind of hard you know to understand that um that concept about zooming in and zooming out because when i speak with other people and i talk about that they're like look at they give you that 500 yard stare you know they're like looking through you <laughs> hey, so what are you saying well what i'm saying is it's it's hard to understand about the zooming in and the zooming out okay and as we're going through these studies, I begin, I have myself even started getting more acquainted with what that is representative of. When I talk to others in the movement, mm -hmm. 
and I talk about zooming in and zooming out, a lot of them give me that 500 yard stare yeah. when I'm talking to them about it. Like because they're looking through, they, they don't understand what I'm saying. It was misrepresented. I think so. That is, we didn't fully understand that when we zoom in, we're zooming into a way mark, right? Because the way that it was done before was these staggered lines, right? But this is quite different. Once we zoom into a way mark and create a new line, we're not just staggering a line. We're understanding a way mark, that Correct. each way mark is a reform line, and, and that isn't well understood. I agree. I agree. And it and we found that really by going through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. That's where it re became really clear. And and just just for the record here, so in 2020, the time change was on November 1st. So so when I'm telling people about that on October 30th, it's going to affect the the presentation on Sunday. The timing of that presentation on the study of the book of Ezekiel. So <clears throat> Anyway, let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study and for the light that you give us. And we know, Lord, that um, we need to seek you every day. Individually, we need to study out these things. And we need to understand your word. So we leave all things in your hands. We pray for those who are struggling in various ways, especially those that have health problems that affect their ability to concentrate. Um, I pray that you can strengthen their minds as they study truth. Be with us throughout this day, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.